I want to welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming. Uh, I know this is an interesting topic, but I also think that Jim Streeter has his personal following, so I'm glad he's the one that's giving the talk. Um, we represent those of us with buttons and who otherwise look like it. We're the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut, and we cover all of New London County. Um, we try and help people not only register to vote, which you all know about, and we're very proud that we have just about reached our 500 student goal for registering kids in almost every high school, at least along the shore, Ledger, and um, Nor one in Norwich. Um, but we do a lot of other things, too. And one of them is to help citizens understand why to vote the way they'd like to vote by providing information. And um, that's one of the things we're trying to do today, is to look at an issue that's percolating in Groton and try and look at the beginnings of um, how Groton came to be, all of Groton, every part of Groton. So we are very fortunate to have Jim Streeter here. In a minute, I will introduce him. First, I wanted to let you know two things. You are very welcome to get your picture taken in this later, if you'd like to, after the talk. And um, something that might be of interest to people you know, um, there is a new system in Connecticut that allows people who are permanently disabled and find it difficult to get to the polls to get a permanent voter, uh, permanent voter registration where if you have a doctor fill out a form and you take it to the registrar, you, the person can get um, ballots sent to their home for every election so they don't have to go to the polls. So if you know anybody, um, there's information about that in the back. It's just one of the new things we're trying to let you know about. And now for Jim Streeter. Um, it was a little over a year ago that there was a ceremony here in the Groton Library to acknowledge the Jim Streeter History Room in honor of his donation of an extensive collection of historical material for Groton. And I read in the article that his wife was really happy that it got out of the house and into the library. He started gathering historical materials 48 years ago by collecting different Groton district and sub-base postcards. He donated a 1600 card collection to the Groton Historical Society, where it is maintained at the Avery Cop House Museum, which I urge you to visit. It's a really great place. He's donated half a house of, full of his historic stuff because uh, it's Jim's overall philosophy that the history of Groton, whether it be written, verbal, or in graphic form, does not belong to one individual. It belongs to and must be shared with everyone. So we're grateful that he's here to share it with us. He has a distinguished career in Groton, including his education in local schools. Following military service in the Army, he became a Grotty City, Groton City police officer for several years. And uh, that led to a career in forensics, which he is still active in today. Politically, he served on the RTM for 12 years and was a councillor and deputy mayor in the city of Groton. He was an elected councillor for the town of Groton from 2005 to 2013 and served as town mayor from 2009 to 2011. In 2010, he succeeded his local history mentor, Carol Kimball, who some of you know, to become town historian. He has authored and co-authored five books on Groton history and was a major contributor for two books published by the New London Day. He's authored weekly Groton historical articles for the Groton Times for five years and is active in providing lectures with visual presentations on Groton history. But tonight, it will just be a talk. Um, last year, when the history room at the at the library here was named after Jim, an original copy of the 1705 state legislator document approving Groton's legal separation from New London to become its own town was presented. And that makes a really a easy segue into our talk tonight. Um, I don't think we could have had a more knowledgeable person to speak about us about our topic today. So thank you, Jim. Thank you. Well, 
Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes okay. Um, well, I know I've attended several lectures, and I look at people with the pages in front of them, you say, boy, I hope he gets through these things. And you can't wait till we get to the last page. She has pretty much taken care of about three pages, so I appreciate that. Tonight is something very unique for me. Uh, I don't know how many presentations, both historical and uh, forensic-wise, uh, that I have given over the years, probably hundreds. And I have never, ever given a lecture without slides. So tonight will be different. So just picture me as I'm the slide, and we'll go from there. Um, as she mentioned, I, I am a native of Groton. I consider myself a native of Groton. Uh, I moved here when I was six months old. So I, I guess that pretty much qualifies me as a native. Uh, I grew up in Bequanic Bridge and the city of Groton. Uh, I went to the local schools. And we had a conversation about this on Facebook the other day. So now I'll show my age a little bit. I went to Fort Hill School, which was a four-room stucco school on Midway Oval. And then I went to the community center, to classes in the old community center that burned down in the 60s. Then I went to Claude Chester. And then I went to Fitch Junior, which is now Fitch Middle. Then I went to Westside, which is now Westside middle, and then I am a graduate of Fitch High School, class of 1963. You can take out your calculators, you'll find out I'm 73 years old, all right? So you, we got that out of the way. I was a police officer in the city of Groton for nine years right after I uh, got out of the military. And I have been involved in local politics for 40 plus years now. Uh, I guess once I left the police department, they lassoed me and said, you're coming on board as a politician or getting involved. And I started on the RTM, and I think Barbara Tarbox was involved at the time. Well, all right, she didn't, all right. Yes, she is. So I actually started in, in the political arena in 1977 uh, on the RTM. And uh, as far as the city of Groton, she mentioned I was on the council. Uh, I was the deputy mayor. I was on planning and zoning for eight years, and now my wife has taken my position on there. And, and she's doing a good job. She's, she's good. Then I uh, decided I'd go to the town of Groton and became a counselor. And then, fortunately or unfortunately, I became the highest vote getter for several years, which qualifies you to be the mayor. And I served as mayor. And I was very proud to do that, to represent all of Groton. Uh, for those two years. Now, she touched briefly on the sensitive issue. Throughout the years, I have served on both consolidation and separation committees. There's pro and con to both. I am not going to discuss that this evening. Uh, it's a very contentious issue on both sides. Uh, and by the way, I did do some research the other day there's been over one dozen studies for consolidation and separation. The earliest one I can find, maybe Barbara knows better, being the former town clerk, is 1964 was the first one that I found. Quite interesting. So this issue has been going on for years and years and years, and it probably will go on for years and years and years. As a result of my being involved, I have met with officials from all the districts of Groton. I have met with officials and members of all the police departments and fire departments. Now, as the town historian, I have researched and authored six books now, just came out with one recently, which include articles about all of Groton, all the districts, all the areas, uh, we're rich in history throughout this, this town. And that has also meant that I have acquired a keen knowledge about our town and the districts and the people and the organizations, which to me, it's, it's a great asset to have. And uh, if I can relay it to people, fine. If you can learn something, God bless you, because I want to teach you something, or hopefully. 
So tonight I'm going to provide an overview of our governmental makeup and how we got to where we are today. Um, and I just said, at, when, I, when you leave here this evening, I hope you have a better understanding about the makeup of our town. Um, and as convoluted and as complex as it is, that you have a better understanding. Because as, I, as I've always said, as complex and it, as com, uh, convoluted as, as it is, it does work. Right? Now, Irene started with a title for this program. Well, let me tell you a little off-the-cuff story. Irene called me about a year, over a year ago, before I even had my 2018 calendar, and asked if I would give a presentation. I said, kind of early. Uh, could you call me back as we get closer to it, to the date? And so about a month and a half ago, I get this email. Are you ready for your presentation? Well, my old age, I, who are you and what am I supposed to be presenting? So the communications worked and, and here we are. But she selected a subject and here's the subject. Groton, town, City, fire district, village, section of town, what are we? So that's the big question that we're going to try to provide some answers to tonight. But to go back, we have to start with the history of how did we get Groton? How did we get there? Where, where was the beginning? So I'm going to give you a little history lesson, all right? And we're going to go way back. 1630, John Winthrop came over from England and brought a thousand Puritans to the Boston area. So shortly thereafter, or five or six years later, we had the Pequot War. As a result of that war, the British, by right of conquest, claimed both Massachusetts and area, what we know today as Massachusetts and Connecticut. Now, he had a son, John Winthrop Jr., and uh, he was actually the founder of New London, but he didn't come to America uh, with his father at first. He, he remained in England, caring for the, uh, the manor, as we call it. I always joke about Grottons. There are seven Grottons in the United States and one in England. And my wife and I have visited every one of them, all right? And the one in England is very quaint, very small, um, but we did go where John Winthrop lived. So that was an interesting trip. He did come to uh, the United States in 1631. And here's an interesting thing. And again, being the, being the historian, you do research, and when you do research, you learn so much and that's the reward of being the historian, is learning. When he came, he came with chemical instruments and seeds for medicine, plants, and herbs. Herbs. Okay, because he became New England's first scientist and prominent physician. However, he concocted some very unpleasant remedies in fact, some of the patients hastened to get well. They didn't want to take these medicines. So I can imagine what they were. In 1644, Massachusetts, the father's area, granted Mr. Winthrop Jr. permission to begin a plantation at or near Pequot. We're going to talk about that. Actually, Pequot is the Thames River. So, it is documented uh, in Governor Winthrop's journal of June of 19, or 1646. The plantation at first was called Namiog. Sound familiar? You're going to hear some of these names from the London and area. Namiog. And it was also called Tatog. Now, Tatog, to me, because my family has, has, since 1957, well, since I would lived in Bacuanic, my father started a fish and tackle store. Tatog is blackfish, okay? 
Can you imagine having your town called Blackfish to talk? But it was. Um, after he established it in 1648, the inhabitants wanted to call it London. But the British court said no. Uh, and they suggested the name Fair Harbor. Does that ring a bell with you? Over in London by the, by the Lawrence Memorial Hospital, Fair Harbor. So the, in 1658, some 10 years later, they compromised. So obviously they had some, <laughs> some discussions about it over 10 years, and it became New London. Right. And uh, I mentioned the river, so I want to talk to river again. Uh, before Winthrop was here, in 1614, the Dutch came here, and uh, they called the river Little Frasissus. But it was also named, or known by other names, called the Great River, or Pequod, with an O-D, or Pequot, and then the Mohegan River. So just, just a little thing of interest. Now, at first, the Groton side we'll refer to as the east side. So if you take your compass, you go up river, that's north, down river is south. So compass points north, east, south, or west, southwest. I got it. We were the east side of the river. At first, it was only used to graze in winter the cattle that they had, the cattle and the oxen that they used. And it was originally referred to as No London East Side. And then this, they, they wanted to name it, so the court suggested either East London or Southwark. I don't know where Southwark would come from except someplace in Britain. That's in Is it in London? Thank you. <laughs> See, I learned something. I love it. OK. Uh, the settlers that came, though, had properties on both sides of the river. They would farm over here, raise their cattle over here, live over there. Then they started building over here. And the first grants that were provided for the east side were in two different areas. One was in the area of Broad and Thames Street, in what we call now call the city of Groton. And the other one was between the Bequanic River and Mumford Cove, farming land. Those were the uh, first grants that were uh, provided. And by the way, and this is interesting, uh, back then it was mandatory, mandatory that you attended church every Sunday. And if you didn't, you were fined. And I believe it was five shillings at the time for, by not attending per person. So if you had a family, you paid for it. Now, you got to remember, Thames River, we didn't have ferry boats and trains and, and the Heritage Park ferry boat or anything at that time. Uh, so you took a canoe or a small scowl over. And this was year round, including winter. Can you imagine crossing that river in the winter? And sometimes, depending on where the inhabitants lived, they would travel anywhere from two to six miles to get to the canoe to go over to the, over to the church. So in 1678, the inhabitants petitioned the court to let them establish a church, church slash meeting house, because they were a combination at the time on the Groton side. It was rejected. Approximately nine years later, they were given permission to invite a minister to speak once, one Sunday a month in the winter. Otherwise, they still had to take the canoe or scowl and go to church. And then in 1703, the court granted the permission to establish their own church. Thus, we started the breakaway from New London to the east side. And actually, Part of the condition was that they would name the east side Groton, which was the origin of the Winthrops in Suffolk, England. 
Another page gone. Good, huh? <laughs> Getting there. Now, at the time, we also had North Groton. That's what the land we know today as Ledgered. That was part of Groton when, it, when we first broke away from New London. And Ledgered separated from us in 1836. And when it did so, it took about 38% of the population with it. So we lost 38% of our population when Ledger broke away. Um, before and just after the Revolutionary War, several villages started to, to pop up throughout Groton. Uh, we had, because of shipbuilding and uh, seafaring activities, we had Mystic, Groton Bank, right on the Thames, and then also Noank, were the three main communities that we had that we started, the villages. And that was the beginning of our districts, as we call them today. Um, as they developed these villages, the inhabitants wanted more services. So, thus we started two things, political subdivisions and districts. And I broke them down into that. So we have two political subdivisions. In 1901, the borough of Groton, which is now called the city of Groton, they uh, were also known as a Groton Bank before they became the borough. They had their own fire department at the time, where it be a bucket brigade, it was still a fire department. And I've heard some stories, and we'll talk about them before we talk about the emergency services. No, I'll talk about it now. Down at the bottom of School Street, where Paul's Pasta is in that area on Thames Street, there was a ferry boat. And when there was a fire, they would blow the ferry boat whistle, and the volunteer firemen would run down to the bottom of School Street to a small building where there was a pumper carriage wagon. And they would commandeer the first team of horses on Thames Street. And they were used as the transportation for that fire truck, sometimes going up School Street. And sometimes the horses did not come back, because School Street is a tough street to be going up. So anyway, uh, back in 1901, around that period of time, the community leaders had the foresight to know that they wanted to provide the inhabitants there, the residents, better services. They purchased a privately owned utility company, which gave them the finances to do so. And they wanted to provide their own streets, besides the utility, a police department, in other services. So they incorporated as the borough of Groton right after they purchased the utility department. And then per state statute, which is 1903, it established the borough of Groton officially. And originally the governmental uh, structure was a warden and burgesses. And uh, now today, as a result of uh, ordinances, et cetera, they now have a strong mayor and council system of government. Now, the statute provided that the town of Groton, remember, we have the town, and now we have a borough in it. Let me stop and explain something. This is when people ask me. This is the easiest way I can explain it. The town of Groton is a big piece of pie. It's one pie. Now you cut that pie into eight pieces. There you go. There's your districts and governments. So the city of Groton is one piece of that pie. Hopefully that will help you understand what I'm talking about. The statute provided that the town, the entire town, part of their money would be given to the city or the borough of Groton for building and maintaining 
highways in the city of Groton required. And then in 1963, the borough petitioned the state and received permission to incorporate themselves as the city of Groton. It has its own fire department, police department, park and recreations, highway department, planning department, its own clerk, and provides refuse collection. It has various supporting uh, commissions and committees to support the government. And the residents of the city vote annually at a Freeman's meeting to approve the budget for the city of Groton. Now, it also has, and this is interesting, and you'll think about this, this adds to the convoluted system that we have throughout the town. It has its own building and zoning regulations within the town or within the city. And again, they do own the uh, Groton Utilities, which is electric and water, and which is now in the last month, it also has its own sewage department, which has raised a little bit of concern in the city to some folks. Right. So, and then the second one we have established in 1921 was the borough of Groton Long Point, which is also called the Groton Long Point Association. And that was per state statute. They petitioned the state and received permission from the state to establish its own government. Now, it's not, uh, it, their government consists of an association with a president, a vice president, a treasurer, a clerk, and five directors. And the directors are supported by several commissions and committees also. Members of the association vote to approve their annual budget also. And they have an annual meeting for that. They also have their own police department, fire department, and water department. And the board members are responsible for public works, or your highway department, parks and recreation, docks, beaches, and lagoons. It's in there, it's in the wording, lagoons. Uh, they also have their own building and zoning regulations. Those are the two, what we called, political subdivisions, which are two of the pieces of the pie. Now we go into the special districts. And, and th this was actually the first one that broke away before the borough even started. In 1879, the Mystic Fire District was organized. And it was established as a result of several very disastrous fires in Mystic at the time. Uh, at the time, the town did not have the facilities or the equipment to provide the fire services on the far eastern part of the boundaries of, uh, of Groton. And Groton, by the way, ran from uh, the Mystic River to the Thames River and six miles from Fisher's Island north. So it's quite, a, quite an area. But again, we were, the ledger was part of it. So by special act, the Mystic Fire District, which, which included both Stonington and Groton at the time because of the fires in Mystic. Remember Mystic? There's two parts of Mystic, one on the, one side, one on the other side, although it's called Stonington and Groton. We have two sides of Mystic, and there are two fire departments that respond to both sides. Then in 1929, the Noank Fire District uh, was established to provide fire protection. And the residents there elect a clerk, a treasurer, and three member executive boards. And they also have support committees and commissions. And they also have their own 
building and zoning regulations. Uh, that group, the fire district, provides financial support not only for the fire department but for the Noink Park Commission. I keep on mentioning the building and zoning regulations because it's very unique. When, when and if someone from outside of this area who knows nothing about Groton moves to Groton, depending where he, he or she lives, depends on what they can do and how they can do it as far as building. And you have business people that come in get very, very confused and frustrated with this. Uh, I know when I was the mayor, I became very frustrated with it because you want economic development. And sometimes some of the regulations discourage it. Can I interrupt? Because sure. you asked me to interrupt for a question. Can you describe the, just the process that somebody would need to go through if they wanted to get a zoning or building permit for, um, say, in the city? What what would what would be the process? And, and that's exactly you hit it on the head by saying if they were building in the city, if they were building in the city, they would go to the city building and zoning office and acquire a permit. If they lived in Nowank, they would go to the Nowank building and zoning and acquire a permit. If they were in the town, they would go to the town zoning and acquire a permit. So depending on which jurisdiction they were going to, which piece of pie they were going to build in or uh, reconstruct, those that's where they would have to go. And each one varies as far as what they can do and how they can do it. And to complicate it even further than that, some of these districts have districts within districts, historic districts. So if you want to put your window in, and if you live in a certain area, you have to, one, get a permit to put the window in, and two, get approval from the historic district to put that particular type of window in. Convoluted, but that's the way it is. Just a follow-up. So, so say I got the permission from the city uh, zoning or planning or whatever, mm -hmm. then would there be any oversight from the town? Would there be any town regulations that would maybe counter that or nope. add to nope. it? Nope, they have their own. Be, so and they're pretty much, the, the overall regulations are pretty much the same. It's just that some of the minutiae, some of the details are different. Mm -hmm. They want a different procedure of how to how to pursue it. But interest, because you mentioned the city. So if, if I moved into the city and I wanted to build a house on Mitchell Street, I acquire a permit and I build the house. If I built it down toward Pfizer, I get my permit, but then I have to go to the Eastern Point Homeowners Association to, for their approval of the work that I'm going to do. It may not be Pfizer itself, it's that Eastern Point Homeowners District. Did that answer your Thanks. question? Yeah. Okay. So now in 1943, remember, we're building up for, the, for World War II in 1943, so we have a lot of military housing coming in the area, specifically in this area, the Quantic Bridge. So they organized uh, to provide fire protection, and the residents of Quantic elect a clerk, a treasurer, and three members of an executive committee. There's no governmental function for this organization, strictly fire. 1960, we see Senator Groton do the same thing, to provide fire protection. They have a president, a vice president, and a secretary, and a treasurer, and five members on the board. Again, no governmental organization. And then I found conflicting, when you, when you do research, you'll find conflicting information, either 1960-1961. The old Mystic Fire Department did the same thing to provide fire protection. Again, President, Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and five members of Board of Director. No government mental organization. Now we add one more. The West Pleasant Valley Fire District. 
Now, this was established to permit the residents of that area to contract with the city of Groton for fire protection. That's all it was established for. Uh, they do have a president and vice president and secretary, treasurer, and five members. No government. I've talked to these people. Interesting, I, I learned this while doing the research for the, this program this evening. The area of the district east of Route 12 became the Quantic Bridge Fire District in 1962. So they separated from that over to here. We have the Mumford Cove Association Fire District. And it was established so they could be taxed, so they could tax themselves to pay no ink for fire protection. That's all they do, all right? And that's brought up at the council meetings every year during budget time. We have to set a tax rate for, the, for them to pay Pequannock Bridge for fire protection. I learned of this one, I found that I get sidetracked sometimes, so I got sidetracked earlier this morning. I will read you this. We have the Field Crest Lighting District. According to my mentor, Carol Kimball, who did research on this, the Field Crest Lighting District organized to provide its own street lights after the old Mystic Fire District, where Fieldcrest is, had emphatically refused a request for lighting. Keep them in the dark. Okay. I found one article, that's all I could find. I, I researched, I went as back, far back as I could, and I only found one article, and that's where the town... In addition, it set a rate of 0.85 mils for the Fieldcrest Lighting District. That's all I can find on it. I've never heard of it until today, so obviously it doesn't exist. So, some special notes. Remember that piece of pie? Everyone in that piece of pie, every political subdivision and every fire district pays taxes to the town. They pay their own taxes for their own special services, fire protection, police, whatever they want, they have to pay for to some degree. However, again, Groton Long Point and the city of Groton, per statute, receive supposed to be the full amount for building and maintenance of highways always been contentious. My highways need more than your highways need. And it goes on and on. But that's the way the state statute reads. They have historically provided money, they, the town, to Groton Long Point and the city of Groton for police protection. 50% excluding the chief. So if Groton Long Point and the city want a chief, they pay for it. But the town has historically provided 50%. Over the last eight to 10 years, Groton Long Point has been cut to about 27 to 30% for their police protection. And I'll give you the mill rates. I'll give you a combination of both. What they pay for their extra services and then what they pay for a combination to the pie and themselves. Right now, the town's mill rate is 24.17. That's $24.17 on every thousand dollars worth of property that you own. And I believe it's only for 70% of the, of the uh, value. City of Groton pays 4.58%. Totally, they pay 28.75%. Groton Long Point pays 3.71% for 
for a total of 28.15. But Quantic Fire District, is, I'm sorry? That's the mill rate, okay? So the, like I said, the 24.17 is $24.17 that you pay per $1,000 of your estimated value, 70% of the estimated value of your property. Mystic is 2.24 for a total of 26.68. Noank is very reasonable, 1.39 for 25.83, Old Mystic is $2.90 for 27.34, Center, Center of Groton is 3.5 for 27.94, West Pleasant Valley is 4.48%. Now, all they're getting is the city fire department, all right, for a total of 28.992. And Mumford Cove pays 0.34, but they have to pay the town also. Now, the residents of the town of Groton, excluding, excluding the city, pays a sewer district tax of 27 cents per thousand for your 70% of your value. And the city residents also pay a sewer fee. However, like I said, recently the, the, the council voted to take the sewer tax out of the city budget and transfer the responsibilities to the utility department. So if you live in the city, when you get your utility bill now, you will pay water, electric, and sewer. That will be on the new bills. Now we'll talk about emergency services. A few years ago, I had a city fireman come to me, and I produced several of these pictorial history books. And he said, Jimmy, let's do a book on the city of Groton Fire Department. I said, why don't we do one better? Why don't we do a book, pictorial history book, on all of Groton's emergency services departments, fire, police, ambulance, dispatch, uh, whatever. Now remember, and I'll speak to that. So fire departments, these are the things I'm sure people will be interested in talking about. The city of Groton has two fire companies. Years ago, most of these fire departments were pretty much volunteer. You had a few paid drivers, but most of them were volunteers. Today, it's just the opposite. I'll give you an example. I, I have breakfast every morning with a former fire chief. He's 93, and he is smart as a whip. And he tells the story when they had volunteers. The whistle would blow, and the engine would go out of the firehouse and it looked like one of those those trains in India where they got a thousand people sitting on top with chickens and everything else. He said, that's what the fire truck looked like. He said, I finally had to tell them no more than five people on the truck. There'd be 20 people hanging off the side of the truck. But I used to, when I was on the police department, we used to joke about the full-time firemen She's all you are is a glorified truck driver, and you turn the, the gauges, and the volunteers would fight the fire. But that's how many volunteers there were. But Quantic Bridge Fire Department at one time had over 300 volunteers. The city of Groton today, they probably, back, back when they were, say we're talking the late 60s, early 70s, they probably had 200, 250 volunteers in the city of Groton. The average now is what they call one half. One half of a person average shows up at a fire, volunteer that is, all right? And that, the reason why it's one half, a person doesn't show up at every one of them, all right? So the opposite has happened now. So the city has two fire departments, the Eastern Point and the uh, 
Pioneer Hose. Mystic has two fire companies, BF Hoxie and the Mystic Hook and Ladder. One's on either side of the river, and they respond to both, both sides. McQuannock Bridge, Old Mystic, Center Groton, Noank, and Groton Long Point. That's five, nine, there's nine fire departments that we have in the town of Groton. Official. All of them will respond to fires and other emergencies outside of their jurisdictions because they have what they call a, uh, a compact through protocols they outlined a mutual aid agreement. So they will respond to every one of them. But interestingly, when we did this book, we said, let's talk about the other fire departments in Groton. Submarine base, electric boat, Pfizer, Groton to London Airport. So I'll, I'm going to wind that one up with one comment later. Police departments, we have the town of Groton Police Department, which has plus or minus 60 employees, including the chief. City of Groton has 30 plus or minus. And Groton Long Point has from three to nine, depending on the season, right, because they get busier in the summer. We have two ambulance associations, privately owned, uh, the Groton Ambulance Association and Mystic River Ambulance. We have two dispatch centers. One is the Groton Emergency Communications 911. And then we have the city of Groton Police Dispatch. They only dispatch police from the city of Groton. Including former police departments, former whatevers, Groton has 21 emergency services departments. That's a lot. But I, I'll go back to the first thing I said. It works. And I'll be honest with you. If I'm having a heart attack or my house is on fire, I don't care what hat the guy's wearing. Just take care of it, all right? And they do work. And I, I have been at many emergencies, serious emergencies. Uh, I've, my family had a serious fire at, at, at a store about eight years ago. Never seen teamwork like that before in my life, all right? Including the outside departments. So now, we are at full cycle. Remember the subject? To answer the question, Groton, are we a town, a city, a borough, a fire district, a village, or a section of town? Short answer, yeah, yeah. In all reality, we're all part of that pie. We're all part of the town. So that's, you know, the last page. Good, huh? All right. But I'll entertain some questions if you have any. Hopefully, I can answer them. If not, I'm sure we have some people in the audience that can assist us. I mean, he helped me all right off the bat with one. Yeah, the ambulances, ED, and Pfizer, um, I believe, has still as many as the base has ambulances as well. You can add that to. In, in, in talking out of school, doing the research for this book, we went to every one of the departments. I was so impressed with the submarine base fire department. The equipment, the staffing, the leadership, they are, I, John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they're the only ones that will respond to hazmat. They're the major contributor for hazmat. You have a spill, they're there. So impressive that if you recall, they had the uh, fire on the submarine up in uh, Portsmouth, yeah. up in Maine. They responded from here. They called them from here. These are the guys that put it out. Right. 
and they received several awards, federal, state, and local. Uh, unfortunately, the submarine was beyond repair, but they are professional as can be. I've, I've, I was so impressed with them. Another thing, because I'm also asked, how come we got three police departments? How come we got, okay. So to try to answer that, in 1917, in May of 1917, I wrote an article for the Groton Times newspaper that explains that. That's, uh, uh, it could have been. <laughs> 2017. There's a group, there's a stack of them back there. You're welcome to take one if, if you'd like it. It is convoluted, but now you know a little bit about each one of them. So hopefully it's, I didn't make you dangerous. All right. Anything else? I have another question. I have another question. When the city became its own uh, city, mm -hmm. you said I can't remember. You said there was one. There was restrictions. Were there any? Can you talk about any restrictions there were to um, the city or any legal uh, issues? I don't see of any restrictions because they developed everything. Uh, they developed their parks and recs. Uh, they had their refuse collection. They had their highway department. There wasn't any restriction. Interestingly, by the way, the city or the borough had the first police department. The town did not have a police department at that time. If uh, two of these entities wanted to combine, do you know of any um, procedures that they would have to go through or restrictions? I'm sorry? If any of the entities wanted to combine with another one, are there, uh, would there be any restrictions there about how that would be done? And I'm asked that very, very frequently. And a lot of people will, let's consolidate. Consolidation of either one of those boroughs, the Groton Long Point or the city of Groton, has to be initiated by the city or Groton Long Point. They have to request it. They have to vote for it before anything starts. Then it also has to be approved by the state because the state approved them for the borough. So there, it would be very difficult to do so, all right? Yes? It sounds like all these high pieces came about because people didn't have enough services. So what was the town not doing? And was it that the town initially wasn't, didn't have representation from all these people? Because it, it's, it seems unusual. No, pri primarily the one service that they needed was fire protection. Remember I talked about the horses down there? Well, those horses couldn't, like today, within five minutes you can be on either side of the town. So to, to go to Noank, they had a big shipbuilding area down. They had some major fires there also. So they established so they could have their own fire department rather than rely upon another area to come in. That was the primary purpose. And then some of the other ones wanted the extra services. Uh, those forefathers that, that, that foresaw building the utility department said, geez, New London had those services at the time. And, Groton residents saying, hey, they've got a police department over there. Why can't we? You know, they got garbage collection over there. Why can't we? Because we, didn't, we couldn't afford it until after we bought the utility department. A, a good portion of the city's budget comes from a good portion of a certain percentage by, by statute of the profits that the utility department makes. So they provide it. So that's very helpful to them. Yes? Isn't some of the issue also that at 150 years ago, the middle of Groton was just farmland and the, the edges were urbanized. So, so they didn't want to pay for sewer and fire protection for these massive outbound expanses. Um, so the city said that we want broadband, I mean fire protection. Um, and this is kind of like the, the broadband issues we have today. Yes. I want to run cables out 10 miles to one farm. Um, that they, that is the issue of the farmers who owned a 
thousand acre farm didn't want to be paying taxes for to for the, the services that wouldn't benefit them. And so the city taxed themselves to get city services and the the rural expanses didn't have to you're absolutely correct because if you take like McCormick Bridge, a lot of farmland, did they need a police department? Mm, not really. But did Groton Bank or the city of Groton along Fame Street, all the businesses, same with Mystic? Yes, they needed patrolmen. So ultimately that's why the, they all became the town. You pay a little bit for the Mystic and the, the borough uh, patrolmen. And now, again, the opposite. The town has the larger police department. The borough is the smaller uh, department today. Yes, sir. So historically, what efforts have been made to consolidate and what were the results of those efforts? In other words, you mentioned that there were a bunch of studies that at various points in time, um, obviously they all failed because we're still we're pretty much where we always been, but, but tell us about the studies and uh, why they failed. I said to myself I wouldn't get involved in the discussion about consolidation. However, they would look at that and the consolidation issue of the two governmental, Groton Long Point and the city, they said, well, we might be able to make some money if we do this. But the city did not want to do it, nor did the town, and it has to be initiated by them. That's why they failed, because these two districts do not want to consolidate at this point. All right. So. Historically, who, who was it that was trying to make this happen, and, and who was it that was resisting it? In my, in, in my knowledge, it was the town that requested it. And I won't get into specifics again. Sometimes the town says, Groton, the borough of Groton has got a utility department. It's a cash cow. So if we get that, we could. And the city says, our cash cow, not yours. Now, the other thing, when I was the mayor, we called in all the fire departments to have a discussion. My truck. Don't you touch my truck. <coughs> Fine. I mean, and it's been discussed, and it's going to be discussed, and it, this is going to go on for quite a while. There are studies that, personally, I don't like the word coordination of services. All right. Are there some services where we could save some monies in the that piece of pie as well as the whole pie, yes. And those, what we should be looking at is to coordinate those particular areas that, that might be a benefit to everybody and try to, try to avoid the personal issues of my truck, all right? Uh, I'll give you an example. If you have, by law, my understanding, you have to sweep your streets twice a year mandatory. So it takes you a week to sweep the street. So we're talking two weeks a year. So that we have a, a sweeper over here and a sweeper over here. Why can't we have one sweeper two weeks in this one and two weeks in this one instead of having two trucks or two sweepers? That's just a thrown off the cuff. That's all I'm going to say about consolidation. Uh, Jim, this has been really interesting, and, and I, I would like to point out that it's not just Groton that has this issue. Ledger has Gales Ferry, um, Waterford and New London work, work together on some things. Uh, East Lyme has Niantic, and I don't know what other divisions. So it is an issue for the entire state uh, that has been talked about. And at, as the League of Women Voters, we would like to continue this conversation and, and maybe get to the next step on, on questions that people might have.